Hi everyone, welcome to October, October Culturama uh, interview with Kendall Johnson. And just to, to give you a little bit more information, uh, you should know that November is our big month for Culturama when we'll have every weekend, we'll have um, Friday and Saturday all day long from uh, 9 a.m. until 7 p.m. on most, most days. Every, every Friday evening, we're gonna have Anders come give us uh, prompts with his special Anders Joy. Um, and we're, we'll be uh, just here with stage after stage and uh, author after author, editors, publishers, everybody talking all the time. It's going to be fantastic. I believe Tommy has, is going to be there as well, um, lecturing for us, talk, talk, talking to us about how to, how to publish. Um, I just gave a, a long discussion about uh, some of the basics, but now you can start talking to publishers themselves and even pitching ideas to them and seeing if it doesn't work for their publisher, they can tell you where, where, to, where to send your stuff, right? And uh, it's, it's uh, one of the most joyful things I've ever done is, is call Toronto and I hope you can, can all join us for that, that month. Not the whole thing probably for everyone, but uh, parts of it. So, okay, but today we're, we're, we're interviewing Ken Johnson. And I wonder if Ken, if you can, I can give you an uh, introduction, but I wonder if you could give us your introduction to you from your point of view. Oh God. Well, as a clinician, um, I have to consider myself my number one patient. And this is because, you know, as, as we were jo joking, Stephanie uh, and I were joking, you got to have some miles down the road before you have a lot to talk about. And um, my experiences as a young person were very intense. I felt very deeply what was going on. And I was also mostly lost during that time. And I'd been raised in a, a very toxic masculine family and uh, did stuff that was to a certain extent crazy. And it's just taken me years and years and years to rub off the... Uh, rough corners that, that that formed. And I found that um, my, my introduction, I'd, I've written before, but it was all didactic stuff. And then I happened upon a meeting of, of John Branningham's writing group, which was in the basement of the, the um, building where my art gallery was. And um, I stumbled in to find a whole assemblage of of writers sitting there and uh, finally figured out what was happening. And, and they invited me to read a couple of things that had, were on the wall with some paintings I had done. Um, and that was the whole start of this business uh, for me of writing stuff that is either nonfiction um, with attitude or, um, more fictive things. And so um, I've just been having a whole new life ever since then. So thank you, John. Huh. Well, since then you, you've published a whole bunch of books, so um, where well, are you now? That's, that's because I've got really good, I run in a good crowd, <laughs> good, good people. And, um, and so I've been very fortunate in, in that. And I've, my particular, uh, joy is to tangle up art with with writing. I think that it's two different languages and to place them on the same page or in juxtaposition or writing about one or painting about the other, um, for me, really does it in ways that I couldn't otherwise. So, And that, that's what the project of Melting into Air is currently. Is, am I correct about that? I've got two major projects that are coming out pretty quickly and melting into air is one of them and um, Fireflies Against Darkness is being published by Aro Arroyo Seco Press. Thank you, Tommy. Um, and the Fireflies Against Darkness is less art and melting air into air is more about the art. So. Um, okay, so uh, I, I don't want to overstep, but I think it's fair to say that you're somebody who who has dealt with and understands PTSD. 
Oh, that's my middle name. I mean, it, it, it's hard to put it on a California driver's license in so many letters, I, I wish I could. Um, yeah, I was a, uh, apart from childhood, which had its own dramas, I served in the military and I was a, uh, in Vietnam with the Navy on some, some close combat off the coast of North Vietnam. And then I've, I was three years as a firefighter with the Forest Service. Then I got involved with, with doing uh, psychotherapy following emergencies. So I was working at treating PTSD um, and then uh, started doing consulting with the agencies that I had served with before and ended up doing on-scene intervention during large emergencies in a preventive capacity. So, so that's kind of the, the tangle up with PTSD. Well, and I, I find your project with your art and your, your writing really, really interesting because you're, you're dealing with your, you're not hiding from this PTSD. Um, you, you are dealing with those incidents. Um, well, that's been, you know, I can't speak highly enough for the process of writing or doing art. If you've got issues left over from difficult experiences, um, sometimes it's best done with the assistance of a, a professional and other times you can wade through it if you have good supportive people in your life. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, it's, it's very good. The, the expressive therapies are very useful for dealing with stuff that tends to hide in corners. Yeah, oh, so somebody just wrote that uh, she Googled and saw the art and it's really wonderful paintings. Well, that's Dina. Well, bless you, Dina. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, right behind you is one of my favorites. This is an expression. Oh. Yeah, this is a little not quite representative. It's a one of a series of four um, the Four Seasons, uh, which are 50 inch square paintings. And there's two of them that comprise one painting. So the painting, the finished painting is hundred inches wide and it serves as a, um, yeah, a, a window covering. Mm. And so they're on rollers. And so you, you pull them apart and they are in on each end of the window, uh, matching one another. And I pull them together and it's a big full scene setting. One's, you know, winter and one's springtime. This is springtime you're looking at. I, I kind of like it. And I like the way it looks on the, the screen. So I simply propped it in place. Well, that, that, which brings me, you know, you, you, you work, um directly with the trauma. And uh, I'm wondering if that kind of work also works indirectly with trauma. Yes, Absolutely. In and of itself healing, do you find? That's, yeah, and that kind of puts me into a moral uh, position that I have to be careful with. Um, I figure if I can do something that's non-injurious for me, um, either in the writing or in the art, then probably it's not going to be harmful for other people. You know, when you carry around a bit of darkness inside, you have to be careful of what you say and what you do, because that can create what's called indirect traumatization, which is like, like a sort of um, an indirect PTSD. I, when I worked in um, two contexts, one was in LA from 92 to 94, with a series of, there was big fire, civil disorder, and a huge earthquake uh, during that time. And I worked with LA County Mental Health. Um, my job was to, to support the counselors that were working with victims. And so over the period of time, there was a, about a three-year project. Over that period of time, we noticed that a lot of our, our counselors were themselves beginning to reflect symptomology that you would expect from the victims. And so looked at the literature, did some, some um, 
some research with them. And we discovered a higher rate of traumatization among the counselors than amongst the people they were counseling. They had picked that up from them indirectly. You once told me a story about the dogs during 9-11, uh, the counseling yeah. dogs. Oh, gosh. You know, one of the really nice things, and you know, this is for you animal lovers, um, one of the really nice things about some of the emergency service agencies is they understand the, the value of support animals. And so particularly after earthquakes, they use dogs to sniff out bodies. And this is rough on the animals. And in New York, for example, they realized that they had about a three day maximum and then the, the animals were just overwhelmed. They were depressed, they were, they were defeated, they, were, they couldn't do their jobs and they brought in um, people who were with training in massage and they worked with the animals through massage and the, the animals were up and at them again. That, that they're so sensitive that to the pain, to their, to their mission, to the fact that they couldn't complete their mission because of the circumstances they were working in, that the animals were just burning out and they found that touch was the main thing. They could, they could get their animals back online serving um, if they did some subst substantive um, massage therapy with them. What, what, what we're talking about here is uh, ways into healing in, through through emotion, mm -hmm. um, and um, we've got a, we've got a group of writers here. All, all of, we have all seen our own traumas in our lives, either healthy or lowercase. How how do you do that? How do, how can they use writing to to get to there? Well, I think personally that if you look at traumas, the the types of traumas that go around generally, and how they reside and, and are carried in a person, that, that we have a very rich area to work with. And much of good literature is based within traumatic incidents or reactions to traumatic incidents or reactions that occur in normal circumstances that are left over from previous trauma. So, you can hardly avoid it. You know, the question is, can you do it in such a way that doesn't, um, doesn't reflect a, an unholy um, obsession with it, that doesn't lock the reader into reenacting their own traumatic stress? And so part of that is finding ways that Reintroject um, healing, hope into dark circumstance. And so, on the one hand, I try and practice when I when I write. If I tell stories, and some of my stories that I tell are grim, um, but what I try and do is contextualize them or interject into them things that provide hope and um, nurture for the reader so that it becomes a learning experience for the reader that is healing rather than hurtful. And then, then for myself as a writer, if I'm trying to do really deep stuff that's ugly, then what I'll try and do is pair up with somebody I know to be helpful in my maintaining my perspective and not getting too caught up with it. It sounds like you, you, you're what you're trying to avoid. The, the dangerous thing is a fetishization of, of pain. Yes, I think uh, I've I've heard you use the term um, trauma pornography, uh, trauma porn, and I think that's very apt because in you know we we've got this huge television set blaring at us every day, most of us, and spectacle cells, and so we have this 
this vision of just appalling circumstance that we're hammered with day after day. Um, when, you know, in the, in the book that I'm, I'm just releasing, Fireflies Against Darkness, I try and take these stories that, that come just from newscasts, interpretations of events by newscasters that we're hit with that paint a dark picture of the world. And I try and look for the sparks of light within that darkness. Uh -huh. So you, you're, like, you're combating then the 24 hour news sensibility that we're always going to be looking yeah, for. I, don't, I, I think that, that even, you know, I've gone through periods of my life when I've disconnected from television and I've just weaned myself from it for months and months. And that's good, but boy, you turn it on once and boom, there it is, um, it's spectacle. And, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and, and the way things are now with the connectedness of everything, we're treated to signs of horrible distress all over the world, every night. And it's hard to keep faith that the world contains good. I'm not saying is good, it's not. There's, there's balances um, going on between what's harmful and, and, and what's nurturing in the world generally. TV spectacle hunger though, um, creates a dark, dark world. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, I wanna open it up the question. If anybody has a question for Ken about writing, he's a great writer, um, about his writing. But anything that um, I'm, other questions to ask, but please feel free to, to put forth your questions. And I think, um, so maybe I'll wait for a second. So if anybody does have a question, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really open to conversation rather than lectures, so please. Yeah. So, so Ken, um, I, you, you brought some stuff. Did you, did you bring uh, something to read for us? I did. I brought um, some of the copy from Fireflies Against Darkness, which, which I wanted to show um, an approach I've used in the past to present stuff that's dark, but in such a way that it's that it's um, it, it's not bright, but it has elements of brightness in it, and I, the most obvious one I used, uh, this technique that's helped me. Um, let me let me show you how uh, we've laid it out. So I'm gonna put on share screen, um, assuming it's enabled. And let me see if I can find where, here we go. Okay. I can't see what what you're looking at at this point. Yeah, so can, what are you seeing? Well, what you're seeing, uh, uh, I'm seeing a bar going across and it's, it's done. Well, that's a little bit better. There we go. Is this better? Okay, yeah. let me do even better. Um, try and spit it out farther so you can see it. So it's Fireflies Against Darkness and it's a, a chat book. And let me go down and show you how this is laid out. So we have a set of poems and the poems are paired up. So on, okay, so in the first one, I start with a, a story that is running on um, the, hypothetical WKNX uh, news, and it's a commentator. So it's about the climate. So this morning, the heat dome we've been experiencing this week continues stretching from the Pacific Northwest all the way to the Great Plains to New York. The average temperature today will be 20 degrees above normal. It's July, only midway through the summer. And this is the fifth such heat wave so far this year. This is Bonnie Palazzo, WKNX Radio. I followed that with kind of a breather, a, 
a, a short terset. This life already and forever is teetering on the abyss, precious and tenuous. And then facing that in the facing page is St. Anthony's story. This is St. Anthony of the, of the um, Desert Father persuasion. So I seek solitude as a spiritual discipline. When I entered this desert, I expected the heat and cold, the scarcity and discomfort. Now I find myself terrified of the things I can't see, hear, but not understand. What is the howling, the noise in the night? What if I fall and I'm injured or sick? What if I can't find water? My loneliness overwhelms. Dreams and delusions haunt both my days and night. I obsess, I hallucinate. I see things I desire coming toward me, taunting me, then disappearing into air. I ruminate. I remember failures, insults, all the ways I fall short. The hardest I face is the temptation to cover up, to shut down, to lose myself within. Out here, the line between imagination and madness grows thin. Yet as I unwrap the city from me, the trappings, distractions, the condition wants, threats, and demands, I find myself within. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll, I'll do another pair to, to reinforce the the juxtaposition of darkness and, and light. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oops. Good evening, Los Angeles. Rich Donovich, KRLA News. Today, Los Angeles public health officials reported 3,058 new cases of coronavirus, a troubling pattern since the January 15th, excuse me, June 15th reopening. New cases over the seven past seven days are up 80% over the previous seven day period. While LA, LA County is large, there are well over 3000 county jur jurisdictions in the US and California has a relatively low rate of COVID. Few miles left, smelling eucalyptus earth, our evening approaches. Benjamin's story. Used and abused as a First Nation child raised in a violent reformatory, he of lines delicate despite tremors, a beauty compromised by rage, the familiar scene of jail, loud iron doors slamming, catcalls, hate, muttered threats, and the beatings. This time, Benjamin Chichi, a world class talent, hanging dead in his cell at age 33. A sad truth he lived, wanting permanent significance now and forever. Yet here's what we're all left with. Our lives only long when they're ugly and too short when good. Fighting for dignity and place in an unjust world, yet somehow Benjamin succeeds for the brief moment, a shooting star against the night sky, a swallow in flight. So let's close that. So that's kind of how Fireflies in Darkness is laid out. So it, it looks like you're, you're uh, developing this so it has, um, uh, it has the darkness, but you're, you're, you're giving us a, a way forward, right? A way forward, a, a reason to hold out for hope. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, I, I've got a question that Stephanie has, and I want to get to that uh, in, a, in a second, but I, I, I'll see what Jose's question is. Yes. Uh, do you think that when somebody has some mental issues, writing helps a little bit to release their pressure? I, I, writing uh, how they're feeling, you think that helps a, a patient? Yeah, look, there was, there's a guy in Georgia um, and I always blank on his name. Um, I'll get it probably in 30 minutes. Um, but he's, he did research. Uh, he teaches psychology in a large university. And so he had access to a whole bunch of, of incoming freshmen, 
for on whom he could do all kinds of of questionnaires, and so he looked at um, at at his, at his incoming students, and through his questionnaires, he divided them into two groups: those who were suffering from significant trauma, and one those who who evidently were not. He then took the ones that were suffering and he divided them into two, uh, into two groups. A, co a control group in which there was nothing changed in their experience, an experimental group, uh, two experimental groups, excuse me, one in which he managed to obtain uh, psychotherapy for that lasted two months, and you can argue that's not enough, but um, it should do something. And then the last group, he had just right, unsupervised, unprompted, free form writing. And you just put them in, this, in, the, in, a, in a room, pencil, piece of paper, and said, go for it, gave him the same amount of time that the other experimental group had listened to, um, a psychotherapist. And so he looked at the resulting in the after test, he looked at the resulting uh, levels of symptomology, comparing them. And he found some interesting things. One is, as you'd expect, there was no change in those who received no intervention. There was no, not a lot of self-healing had gone on. But with the other two groups, he looked and there was significant healing that had happened. One of those groups was those who were sent to the shrink and the others, those who were allowed to write. And what the interesting thing for this and the thing that psychologists don't wanna talk about because it threatens their business flow <laughs> is, <laughs> is that the people who did writing had just as much symptom amelioration as those who were seen professionally. So that is a, an empirical answer to your question, uh, something that a lot of folks find. There's whole types of therapies that are done, uh, the expressive arts therapies that are done with, with that in mind. But um, so I, I hope that answers that. In my experience clinically, yeah. And in my own life, yeah. Okay, so let's go to Stephanie's question next. Uh, which, uh, and uh, I, I really felt this over my career. I started teaching, I was 26 years old. In one of my first classes, I had seven students who had children who were older than I was, because uh, I teach at night. Uh, and uh, so she, she, she asks, um, uh, I love what you brought up about, about John B., who is, of course, younger than we are. What advice do you have for us older writers and our possible anxieties for working with teachers who are much younger? Oh, yeah, that's a great question, Stephanie. Um, and it's really a hard one to answer. Of course, you should have anxieties because there's such a huge difference in experience. A great deal went on between 1970 and 1990, historically. And it's hard to relate to people who didn't walk that. They were children at the time, you know, and, and then they hit the beach and lots has gone on and lots of it's been difficult. But I, I in one of the, <laughs> I, I recall, you know, writing a little mini story about um, somebody who had, um, gone to see a shrink and it was he, he was talking about um, something that had occurred long ago and the the shrink could not relate to what he was saying they, they they'd seen um, things in the news about it but they didn't live it and they didn't live the uncertainty surrounding it and they didn't live the possibility of alternative outcomes. And they didn't live the, the shock of seeing things go sideways the way they did. And so they couldn't relate experientially to what they said. So that's an issue. And I understand that anxiety. 
I live it too. Um, what I would suggest that if you're working with someone who's, you know, if you're working as a teacher with somebody who's also teaching and they're much younger than you, then open up and listen to them. If on the other hand, you're working with somebody who is, um, if you're older and, and you're listening to, you're, you're being taught by somebody who is a different age, the, the, the bottom line is the same. It's about communication. There is, you know, apart from all of the ideals about, about teaching objectives and teaching standards and all of this, um, the only way you can do is find common ground. You have to talk. And that's very difficult when you have huge numbers. Um, I think it's more tim intimidating probably for younger teachers to talk to older writers because they feel that, that there's something less valid about their own experience. Um, that doesn't mean that, that you have to ignore uh, the principles you're trying to teach. But what it does mean is you have to stay really open to discrepancy of experience. It's, it's just about as serious as a cultural divide. You know, that. It, it, it's just anytime two human beings come from different places, it takes openness and um, a, an intentional effort to seek out what the other person is saying and check your understanding against what their intent was. Is that at all helpful? I'd like to throw in some things. I think there's something that's necessary for the teacher and you need to find this teacher. You need somebody with growth mindset and you need somebody who is willing to engage in culturally responsive teaching mm -hmm. rather than, than, you know, so that they're, I mean, the, the teacher needs to be able to hear and be corrected. Um, so, so. Exactly. And um, the student needs to understand when the teacher can't and not evaluate themselves as being uh, somehow flawed because they're not heard. They need to seek out teachers who can listen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Stephanie, if, if, I, if I'm ever uh, speaking from a place of youth, I want you to, to uh, call me out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really like working with you guys because you, 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 you call me young. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but John, remember that's not always a sign of disrespect. <laughs> no, no, that's great. And then D Dina, Dina had a question and then we'll get to, to Linda. She said, can you please give and show examples of how you compare, combine art and writing? Oh boy, I'd love to. So um, I've been working on this project about, it's called Melting in the Air. And it's gonna come out in two versions, a chapbook version with longer poetry and a, um, an artist, a, a, an exhibit catalog with shorter poetry. And so, Rather than go into the longer poetry, which is, takes a long time, I'll go right to the shorter version and show you how I feel personally um, that the words and the nonverbal aspects relate. And we can talk about why and how you see them relate. So let me, let me start this up again. Um, Whoops, got it wrong. Hang on, I didn't close down the other one. First, I gotta do that first. Okay, and this one, yeah. Well, I'll show you, I'll start by showing you 
the difference in poetry, and then we can go to the pictures with the poetry. The longer, the, the, the form is a chapbook will have smaller pictures. This coming out with literary alchemy have smaller pictures, but longer poetry because the emphasis is more on the spoken word than in the, the art gallery uh, catalog as one would might expect. So let me try and make this go again. Okay, do you see the valley at uh, the Abbey at Valley Yermo? Yeah. Okay. So this is, the way this is structured is there are six different stories. Each story has five parts. And each of the five parts in each story has its own independent picture. And I'll show you how that relates in just a minute. But we'll start with um, the first part, the introductory part to the story, An Abbey at Balliermo. I find myself on the summit of Mount Baldy at 10,000 feet elevation at dawn. I've begun walking since early hours following the beam of my flashlight and then made the top in time to see the sun break darkness. Los Angeles, my life up till now, lies behind me. Looking north, the Mojave Desert stretches as far as I can see. Morning light enhances color, yet even now the pastels look dusty and the land seems endless. Only a breeze can be heard as it blows through my heart and fear for no idea, for I have no idea what to do. I can almost see the monastery at Valley Irmo at the base of the slopes below. I remember Father Eleutherius who lived there. In fact, this is an actual guy who, who did teach and preach at that, that um, place. Hang on. Now I will load up the other version. And we'll see if I can make this go. So this is basically the same movement, but that's done in a charita form. Charitas are six line poems starting with one line, then going to two lines and going to three lines. And they're basically kind of um, trying to capture the intersection between the immediacy of short form poetry and the um, positioning of the poem within a journey of some sort. So the first one, which corresponds to what I just read, Seeking Kerouac's taste of rain, I can almost see the monastery in the desert far below. Climbing through inner darkness, up this dry and endless trail, straining here silent thunder within. And then it goes to the second part, but this is the juxtaposition I like between um, words and images. That, that both of those tell essentially the same story, but do it very differently. And the words tell it looking at, it, it's sort of like looking through a cut glass or cut gem. And you look through one facet of that gemstone, you see one configuration of light and form. You look through the other facet, you see a little different configuration. Another way to look upon this is that, that I find useful is, uh, excuse the retreat into military jargon, but this would be triangulated fire, where you have the words coming at the same thing from one direction, the image coming at it from a different direction. The truth lies somewhere beyond both. Okay, so in this case, this painting 
shows what's being said in the words in one way. The second painting looks like that. Father Eulotherius Winance, the priest, sought solitude, austerity, sacrifice, different landscapes, dry and human. Now he served in a modest monastery, each week traveling to minister cities, his new and different kind of desert. The, the paintings are fairly large. They're, they're acrylic with um, in a, in a heavily textured base. His discipline sustained him, patterned within chaos, giving reason, purpose, calm. Up before dawn for prayers, plant, uh, gardens to plant, food to prepare, hours reading Latin and Greek. Redefining desert. LA soul crushing anonymous sprawl, its traffic, smog, and subdivisions, the priest had found the perfect place to fulfill his monastic vows. Rising above silver desert waters, the rocks strewn wild, stretching far beyond. Hawks ride updrafts and thermals above ragged cliffs and peaks, black ravens lift towards morning sun. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? I do. Yay, Dina. Yeah, because you started with actually a, a, a scene yeah. And, and then you went to the paintings and then you went also to this um, po poems, I would call them. Why did you, why did you include the prose in the beginning? Is it, it, it what I read to you, what I read to you at first, yes, before first, we got yeah. onto this, before the yeah. paintings? Yeah. Two different books. Ah, okay. The, the paintings will be in there. This one is, this will be the gallery catalog. Right. The, what I read to you before will be a chapbook. I see. So it's, so it's kind of um, three different takes then, if, if you will. And the same thing. And, and the, the whole collection of six, I, I guess you could call them stories, each consisting of, of five charita. Um, the whole six stories point to a journey through the desert, a journey for reconciling, in my case, um, military experience. Oh, I see. I want to see more. Okay. <laughs> I'm blowing. I'm sorry. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm okay, sitting here question. in New Zealand, by the way. Hello. Are you really? Uh, yeah, I'm the one from New Zealand and I'm just like, really, it's, it blows my mind. I didn't expect uh, it to, 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 to be so impressive for me because I'm an artist as well. So this is are really you? just like, <laughs> can I, can I see more? Can I see more of the, the Yes, movie? you may, but I, I just want to point out what two things. I've got another question. I believe at least one. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to, to mention that don't believe the newspapers. Not everyone in America is deranged. Most of us, perhaps, but not everyone. There's, <laughs> there's a little bit of sense still running around. OK, uh, there was another question. Then, then we'll, we'll, to answer you, yes, we'll get, and I'll show you another series of, of five, perhaps. Um, Thank you. I don't, uh, the way I have this on, I wanna leave it on and screen share because that gives me, um, I, can, I can refer to the paintings and poetry, but what I can't see is the chat box. I can see that again. And so there's a question. From Linda. Yeah, Linda has a question. Okay, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now it's more, well, one is a comment from what you were talking about before about people of different age groups and yeah. the idea of the openness. And, you know, I have found that 
working with groups that are completely different, whether they're from different countries and they're working on a project together and they have so many differences and conflicts. Um, only through lots of experience have I found that really having them look at the overarching goals that they have and the threads of similarity like you were talking about is, is the only way to even start the resolution of how we're going to work together. And I thought that was so such a great description, how you described it, um, what you need to do, what a facilitator also needs to do to help reach, make progress was mm -hmm. so true. Um, the other thing is the, the question I had really was the um, study that you shared mm -hmm. regarding the interns, you know, the new students, the freshmen. James, James Penny Baker. The, I told you the name would filter up eventually. Oh, good. Because um, is there a way, I mean, you don't need to do this, but we can find it. But um, is there a link to that study at all? Because it is very useful. Um, it's kind of like the Hawthorne experiment at the uh, General Electric. And I, I don't know if you're, I mean, it's years and years ago, but it was a breakthrough study. And it, it's kind of similar to the study that you're talking about. Only your, the study you talked about was focused on how writing can help. Yeah. And um, can help, you know, somebody who's facing a trauma, which is different than the Hawthorne experiment. But yes, there, is a, there is a thread of similarity with those two experiments. Um, anyway, so if you have a link to that, I would love to know what that link is. Or I, I can don't have it handy, but I'll forward it to you in a okay. personal message because you're in the, the group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, the author's name is James Pennybaker. And he's written two books on this. Um, his first book is went off on that study and then talked about different ways. And then the second book was much more experiential. It's like, here's how to write, you know, here's how to do oh. it. And so he, he, yeah. he does, he kind of violates his own principle and, and gets all directive when he talks about the, um, how to do it. But um, I think it's something like, um, something about opening up. And I, that's that phrase, if you Google James Penny Baker, and the phrase is opening up. You'll probably yeah. find it that way. Okay, I'll find it. I'm pretty good at that part. Sure you are. <laughs> the research. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That was really um, a fascinating study, oh, and thanks. and it wasn't a surprise, but it was a great. I know. Specific specificity. It's it's one thing to know stuff intuitively, and it's another thing to get empirical verification, which. That's kind of a, a difficult concept because there's so many ways to screw up empirical research um, and, and draw the wrong conclusions. But basically, when you see it verified in the world, it helps when you pass it on to others. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I just dropped a link in the chat. So if you'd like to, for, for that book. You're, you're quick, Anne. <laughs> uh, Jose, you've got a question. Yes, um, I enjoy when you combine art with uh, for both forms of art, right? Mm -hmm. Your images that you see and the emotions they convey. Yes. It's a great way to combine two forms of art. And the other one is to add music. Yes, and absolutely. And then get a glass of wine and enjoy yep. a seat with the person that you love. To me, that's the ideal way to put it. There's no way, you know. Uh, so I love the you combine this form of poetry mm -hmm. and how you perceive it, your feelings. I'm a veteran too. So I relate oh, yeah. to you because most people don't relate to that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But then combining the, the picture where you were in the desert, which is a fantastic place to be. It brings yeah. some emotion and the vocabulary, the emotions, I uh, really like it. I like to do photography with, with my poetry. Well, there you go. Yeah, so combine two things to make it better. But thank you. I really appreciate your 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 um, 
your expertise and your passion about the written work and the paintings. Thank you. Jose, thank you. And I, I just, I'll share with you, I've, I've got this idea going for another project and that is to get in the car and go up uh, 395, Highway 395, which, which goes up along the east side of the Sierras. Because there's all these really wonderful places up there that are oh, just, yes. yeah. So I'm thinking um, of of using the Charita form mm -hmm. and and doing photographs probably um, and and doing a Charita from each of several a number of stops. So I think I'm I'm going to entitle it something like um, picking up Charitas along 395. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, back to um, Dina. Let me continue down um, and get or back up, I guess. Hang on a second. One, two, three, four, five. I'll give you one, another one of the stories. Um, it says the story is out of the desert. The Charitas. Um, go like this. Seeing hardened desert sandstone reminds me of the morning of 9-11. Her commute passes the Pentagon. Former flight nurse stops and helps, and helps, does what she can to triage a diamond formed under pressure. This is a, a nurse friend of mine. Dismissed, oh, excuse me, only a desert dismissed by passing drivers blinded by consumer condition taste. I think of students with crutches and wheelchairs and how they would see all the potentialities of space. Gyrations twist and contortions, absurd Joshua trees carpet across desert floor, lifting arms in prayer in prayer to their gods of sun, wind, quiet, sing arboreal rhythms south of Barstow. <laughs> Grinding tectonics, San Andreas fault line always in formation, the highest mountains melting, new horizons squeezing, horizon squeezing upwards, all will return to the sea. Incandescent, blending mirage and reality, stretches for lifetimes north. This freeway winds toward downward from desert high falling into dazzled LA twilight. So, so. So, uh, I, I, maybe give a description of these paintings. The, those that I've experienced are four feet by three feet, something like that. Depending, yeah. Some are some are forty by sixty. Some are some are much much smaller. But I've I photographed them rather rather than adhering to their original dimensions. I photographed them or details out of them in a square format because of the uniformity it provides. You just imagine um, 30 of those things lined up in identical sizes, each with a poem beside it. Mm -hmm. And I can't get that. I, I held that exhibit three years ago. Um, and some of them are really big and they, they, it's a stunning exhibit when they're all together in their original size but we're in a smaller space for this exhibit. So I, so I did the, the uh, identical sized and um, I think they'll, they'll go better in a book that way. Are, are you showing this at the Sassy Museum? Yes. Okay. In Pomona. You, uh, when, when, when will that be? Last I heard it's scheduled for January. Okay. But you know how things are going down there. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it may be next January. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll keep everybody up to date on that. The Sassy Museum, if you are in the LA area, is in Pomona, uh, just off Gary and and uh, Mission. Uh, not there exactly, but pretty close to Gary and Mission. Um, and so, right right next to the Fox Theater in Pomona. And uh, so, we'll, we'll, I'm sure he'll have a reading, and we'll be interviewing you and doing poetry as well. That'd be really fun. I'm looking forward to it. I love the conversation that comes when people confront art and writing together. Suddenly it just, it does point beyond. It, it, it ceases being defined. That's interesting. It, it's a part, you know, the, one of the postmodern um, moves is to take art off the page and put it in your, your mind, right? It's the conversation more than the, the piece of art as well. Right. Are you, are you doing that intentionally? Is this, this what was your... Yeah, but yeah. Um, short answer, yes. Long answer, a little bit more complicated. Um, that process of internalization and reconfiguration within the viewer's mind then opens up to personal interpretation. And that's precisely why I don't do closely figurative work. I, I want work that's evocative and suggestive, but not definitive. Uh, so that the, that the art is also in the hands of the viewer. The art is in the hands of the viewer and the words juxtaposed with that incoming um, visual data, the words just serve to stir the, the brew and it grows, it rises of its own. Okay. I think we might have time for one more question, kind of a shorter one. Please. Anybody have a question I'd like to ask? Okay, well, I don't know about all of you, but uh, uh, all these ideas coming from Ken have made my mind a little bit mushy. Uh, uh, I I'm gonna, somebody asked if there's any way that, that I can be contacted. And I'm going to put my email address on this um, so that I can be. Oops. You know, we should say to Dina too, um, we're, during the month of November, during Culturama, Ken is going to talk about the intersection of painting and art. He's going to lead, lead one of our workshops. Uh, I'm sorry, painting and, and poetry. Um, so that, that, that I can't remember which weekend. I know it's pretty early in the day. Um, so <laughs> it's, so. it's surprisingly not as huge a time difference as I imagined it being, having gone down there. Um, and so it's it's manageable. Right, and we'll, we'll, we'll put as many of these as we can on, on our web page as well. Yeah. So great, Ken. Do you have anything last words you have for us? Um, I just I just love the fact that you're all here. It speaks to your your own passion in your commitment to this this whole project of, of expression. And, and, and thank you for being here and thank you so much for the discussion that you've given me. So thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Ken. Bye, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ken.